uh, in two to five years, uh, roughly speaking, on your own uh, with your own businesses and, and, you know, decades of experience prior to that in high-end uh, uh, technical executive roles. Um, so if we could, can you guys, uh, James, Dan, Michael, Mike, give us a sense of uh, top business needs of the VCSO community um, from, your, from your perspective? And we got a little preamble to this, so hopefully we're, uh, we're juiced and ready to go. But I don't know who wants to take it first, but uh, I'm going to... I'm going to go silent here and let you guys get started. I'll take a first crack at it. So um, I know one of the things that I struggle with is the, the financial administration side of just running the business in general. Um, I, I use QuickBooks. Man, there's got to be something better out there than that. Um, I, I feel like I need a minor in accounting to, to use QuickBooks. And everything. I, every simple little thing I try to do, it's like, I don't do it often enough to remember how to do it and get proficient at it, uh, right. but it still needs to get done. So, so for me, it's actually kind of running the business side of, of being the VC. So, right. It, and by the way, what you said, I think is parallel across a lot of us in startup and small businesses, um, not, not just the VC. So space, but that's a great yeah. one. So just kind of managing the books and understanding costs uh, you know, closing books on a monthly basis, prepping for tax season, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we found that hiring an a organization called Office Squad, um, they're kind of our back end financial part of our team, uh, helped us. And I mean, we're small, I mean, less than five people. Um, and so there's not a whole lot of stuff on there, but they look at all of the activities on all the accounts and they assign things properly. They set up rules in QuickBooks. So if it comes in from, you know, um, Best Buy, you know, it's probably office tech equipment and it automatically gets assigned to that account. And then that way at the end you get, here's your, you know, your statements, all of your documents, your budget and uh, balance sheet. And then as a leader, you can look at that and say, okay, I, now I know what my organization is doing financially. Um, and here's how I can go forward with that. You know, where's the money coming in, going out? Um, and you can just make decisions as opposed to getting stuck in the weeds of, uh, th there's a chart of account accounts and there's 3,500 of them and none of them make sense. You know, that's, you know, as VC says, not all of us are financial people. Um, so I, I quickly learned a while back, do what I do good and, and let somebody else do what they do good. Great. Thanks for that. And that was James. Oh, that's right. Jim Farenberg. Yeah. Jim. Thanks. Yes. Excellent. Um, very cool. Yeah. What else guys, what else uh, is on so top of the list? Yeah, it's Michael. Um, one of the things that I think has been very interesting is, you know, the kind of whole fractional model, right? Businesses understand or, you know, you know clients understand the, the need for outside counsel. They understand a fractional, you know, CFO. Um, you know, there's been a lot of organizations that have won a fractional chief marketing officers over the past uh, decade. But the idea of outsourcing security um, or outsourcing the leadership, right? The, the, the management around information security is relatively new. And, and I think we're still in an age of educating um, our clientele in terms of what a VSO, what a VSISO can bring to the table, um, why there is a need. It just seems to me that we continue to educate the, uh, you know, the small and medium-sized businesses that we're all targeting on exactly what the value proposition is. And that's the, for us, that's continues to be one of the biggest challenges. Great. So, so Michael, I mean, it kind of goes back to, I think what I was touching on earlier too, was just normalizing what that value proposition is um, in the market. But I can see where, yeah, having to continually you know, somebody needs a CFO, you know, they, they know what that function is, right? And they know what the value is. But um, yeah, I, I see that as well. Just not quite understanding what a VCSO, VCISO will do for the business. Anything else, guys, um, in terms of top needs for the, from a business perspective for the VCSO community? I was going to uh, jump in and talk a little bit about the legal aspect, you know, contracts and agreements. 
Yeah. Uh, scope creep is the term you'll hear a lot of us throw around a lot because, you know, we're not experts, we're not attorneys in writing um, legal agreements. And sometimes you find yourself in a position where uh, the scope of work has expanded a lot. Right. And you want to make sure that you write a really good scope of work and a really good contract. And you can do that with some of the templates. So you can go legal zoom, you can go rocket lawyer or one of the other ones out there, but ultimately you have to come up with your own to make sure that you maintain a good scope of work and everybody stays in their lane and you get yeah. paid for the work that you do. So that's, yeah. that's a challenge do, for everybody. I, I can definitely see that. Um, do, do you all, do any of you exclusively do an hourly billing model? for that reason, you know what I mean? So, you know, scope creep is, becomes a function of, you know, acceptable because you're gonna bill for every hour anyways, or are the, the, ma the majority of you in a fixed fee retainer type environment? So I am just hit on timesheets is another area that when you're tracking time, uh, Craig. Yeah, I, I think somebody else is about to jump in to talk a little bit more about that. I'll, I'll hand the baton over, especially since my gardeners are here on, on cue to start mowing the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> it was just you. me, Michael. No big deal. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even remember what I was going to say. So, you're, um, you're on hourly versus and you're oh, yeah. so, so from my perspective, I, I do primarily hourly. If I do a fixed fee, it's I, I wouldn't even call it a fixed fee, the client thinks it's a fixed fee but I calculate the hours and I do a minimum and a maximum. And uh -huh. if it exceeds the maximum, then there's a, a written um, deal. And I've already got the hourly work or hourly rate built into the contract. So it's, it's a little bit of a hybrid, but I won't do just a flat out fixed fee. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else has any opinions on that. I think we could probably do a whole hour on that. On that uh, and I was gonna, I'll jump in, Craig. That is interesting because we do, probably 50% of our engagements are, um, you know, long-term reoccurring revenue, fixed fee, uh, retainer, whatever, whatever term you want to use. But uh, yeah, we do quite a bit of that. Now we do a lot of what Dan describes in terms of min maxing what the number of anticipated hours are. Um, and we've had to go back and renegotiate some contracts, but I would say about 50% of our engagements are long-term you know, retainer type of engagements. Maybe I just don't have the confidence in my estimating skills. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, something I, you definitely learned. <laughs> the hard, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been working for free for the last few weeks. So, yeah. That's a good point of joining the community. It'd be great to throw around some ideas on how to estimate and how to come out with some of those guesstimates as, as we call them too. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward totally. to some of that. Right, and I, I'm sure some of you will do bottoms up. Hey, here's the task. Um, here's the here's what I heard from the client. I'm going to estimate it's, you know, X. Or you go out and you get a sense of their budget, you know, and 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 you go top down and just kind of build into the, you know, into the budget. So um, I'm sure well, you've all been in both those situations. Um, but and I'm sure as as you all get more repeatable you get a better sense of, okay, I've seen this movie before, you know, and I've, from what I've heard from this client, this one's going to be X and, and this client's going to be Y. Um, but probably takes a little time to get there. But that's a real, yeah, really interesting topic. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you, Craig. I see Bill just raised his hand, so maybe he wants to add something. Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to say that we, in my practice, we, are a little bit diverse. I specialize mostly in healthcare and I work with a lot of startups, not exclusively, but probably 50% of my practice is startup business. So we work, we have a variety of models. Some projects are time and materials, some projects are fixed fee, some projects are fixed monthly annuity, and we fix the number of hours we deliver to the customer. Uh, for a lot of startups, it's typically a fixed monthly annuity plus some sort of back end equity, which is kind of a hard model. I won't describe it here. But uh, it just depends on the project. I mean, yeah. I, I don't think there's one size fits all for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, great. Good stuff. Um, listen, I, I, I feel like there's an entire, like I said, an entire hour on this. Um, and I think we can maybe put a pin in this for a later date, but it's a really good topic. Um, and with that, 
Um, unless any of the other panelists had something they wanted to introduce, um, I think from a timing perspective, we might be good to get into some of the other pieces of content. Great. Okay, good. Um, so thank you for that really good conversation. Um, I want to bring Dan on here, uh, one of our panelists, and we've got a, each of our four panelists are going to jump into a, a best practice or tip that that they're going to bring forward here uh, for the benefit of the community and something to think about. So, Dan, I'll turn it to you here for uh, to talk about specialization. Fantastic, thank you, Craig. Um, before I jump into that, I want to I want to give Craig and Laura Donna a, a shout out. I, I know how hard you guys have worked over the past year or two to, to get this put together. And uh, I, I think it's fantastic. I've uh, uh, probably not helped you as much as I, as I could have and should have, and I apologize for that. But uh, I am honored to be included in this today and in, in the launch. So thank you guys very much for, for your hard work. And I'm excited to see where this goes. Um, one of the reasons I'm really excited about this community and what you guys have done is, is the, the, the cooperation we can bring to each other, right? You know, if we, we all look at it, we're all VCSOs. Um, you know, some of us are competitors, but more than that, I think I think we're more complementary than we are competitors from a VCSO perspective. There's no shortage of business out there. It's just finding the business, which is another business topic that we didn't get to there. Um, but you know, I I, I want to stress and, and make maybe make everybody kind of feel a little bit more self-reflective after this. Um, but specialization is a good thing, right? I, I find so many times that I'll be talking with people that I get introduced to or something like that. And they say, oh, I'm a VC. So I'm like, oh, really? You know, that, that's great. Tell me about your business and all that. And what they're doing is they're doing, uh, you know, desktop configuration checking. That's their specialty. Um, and I'm like, well, that's not VC. So work, right? That, that, that is a tool in the VC. So's tool belt, an extremely important tool, but it doesn't make you a VC. So, right. So, so I want, I, if I leave you with nothing else, I, I, I'm hoping that everybody kind of does a little self-reflection, like I said, and and be true to yourself, right? Be, do what you do. And I've loved the conversation we've had so far because everybody is talking about specialization, just not within the cybersecurity world. We all say we're cybersecurity professionals and we are. We've talked about specialization of legal. We've talked about specialization of, of, um, of, of accounting. Um, I think we need to take it the next step farther and start focusing and talking about and realize that we have specializations within cybersecurity as well. And, and one of the things that, that I like to, to do from, from a conversation perspective is, is compare cybersecurity to the medical professional. So if, if Craig and I met in a bar for the first time and Craig tells me he's a doctor, the first thing I'm going to say to him is like, oh, fantastic. What, what kind of doctor are you? Right. And he's going to tell me whatever it is. He's, he's an orthopedic, right? Okay, cool. Well, I've been having these headaches. Um, I, I don't need to talk to Craig about my headaches. He's, that, that's not his specialty, right? So it'd be a waste of his time. It'd be a waste of my time. And I certainly don't want the orthopedic operating on my brain. So, but if we meet Craig and Craig tells me he's a cybersecurity professional, what do we do? We say, like, oh, fantastic. I bet, man, I bet you're really busy with all these breaches, right? We have no idea what he does in the cybersecurity space. We all know that it's way too vast for any one of us to, to know everything. So what's important and what I love about this um, community that we're getting, that we're long, now we've got a place to find that specialization. Um, we were just talking, I think it was Bill who said he specializes in the medical, medical field, right? I've never worked in the medical industry. The clients for something specific or high trust and I need a lot of hardcore medical experience, I, I can't help them, right? And I think if some, some VCs actually will take that on and BS their way through it, um, or they do their own little specialization and say, okay, uh, yep, you've got policies and procedures, or I've done a vulnerability scan or a penetration test, man, you're secure. And that business leader who doesn't know that they need to hire the VC so in the first place because they don't understand what we do, they walk away with this incredible false sense of security that they've done everything they need to do. Um, and, and I think it's on us as part of the education that we were talking about before. I think Mike brought it up uh, is, is to continue to educate those business owners 
on the whole ecosystem of why they need a VC. So I think of us as that family practitioner that pulls into all the various special discs that we need to treat that particular patient, right? And then we're making sure that those other doctors are not taking advantage of the patient and not running tests that don't need to be run or not interpreting things and all that kind of stuff. That's how I view the VC so role. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, this will ring true. I'm, I'm up on my, my five minutes, but, you know, embrace your specialty, right? We've all got them. We've all do something things differently. Embrace it, be proud of it and, and, and be true to it and leverage this community to bring the other specialties that are complementary to us. Cool. Great stuff, Dan. Um, very cool. Um, let me jump back on camera here. Um, I'm going to move next to Ryan. Ryan, you still out there? I am. Okay, cool. Yeah. So James, I'm going to come back to you in a second. I know Ryan had a um, has a hard stop. He's got something he's going to deal with. But I want to bring in Ryan Cloudier. He's the president of Security Studio, uh, sponsor of uh, today's event, and you know, good friend of many in the virtual CISO community. Really passionate about. Um, you know, about the, the people and the role of the, the virtual CISO. So Ryan, i give you the floor here for a few minutes um, to tell everybody about yourself and, and, uh, and Security Studio. Thanks, Craig. Really excited to be here. Uh, in addition to being president of Security Studio, I am also a BCSO, which is why I'm short of time, something I'm sure you all are very familiar with. Um, so what Security Studio is, is a risk assessment platform that we make available to VCSOs to help them conduct their risk assessments more quickly. Um, for example, most small businesses can get a comprehensive complete risk assessment uh, within Security Studio in about four to six hours. Uh, and in addition to doing just the assessment, we also help you to actually manage the work outputs, uh, schedules, interact with the client through the platform. Uh, so some VCSOs like to work you know, with the client on mitigation remediation. Some VCSOs like to kind of keep that behind the curtain. What we do is provide a very simplified platform that allows a VCSO to put risk into context for the business leaders, as well as the technical teams. So our, our system uh, uses a, basically a credit score, 300 to 850. And our executive reporting is designed to be consumed by C-level Congress people, school board members. And our technical reporting satisfies even the most hardened and savvy security expert. The idea being that most of us, step one of any engagement is getting our hands wrapped around what is the business risk, right? And as a VC, so our job is to try to put that risk into context, to try to empower the business to make effective risk decisions, and then implement those decisions to the best of our ability. Uh, I kind of joke sometimes that it's, it's my job to uh, implement your terrible decision and mitigate the disaster that results from it. Um, as we know, businesses are going to choose the risks that make sense to them. And sometimes that's in conflict with what security thinks it should be. So our platform allows you to have those conversations in a technical but also non-technical way. Um, very happy to be here to sponsor this. I think this is a great idea. Uh, as Craig said, I'm, I'm very passionate, I'm very active in the security and VCSO community, uh, and I'm here to help. So I'm not here to sell you stuff. That's not how I do business. Uh, I'm always available to help any VCSO um, or even your clients. Uh, that's not a business proposition. That's an offer of help. If I have a product or a service that fits a need you have, then we can have that conversation. Uh, but really, we just we want to help the world be a safer, more secure place. So the last thing I'll say, and I'll put the link in the chat, we make available a free personal risk assessment so that individuals, families, employees can take a look at their at-home risk behaviors uh, versus what they're doing at work. We know security awareness training in the workplace is not as effective as we would like. And we believe that's because we're not forming relationships and talking about risk with folks in a way that makes sense for their dinner table. If we talk about, you know, the business is at risk, the business is at risk, well, I'm just a human, what does that mean to me? But if we ask the question, how do you keep your family safe from cybercrime? Now we've changed the conversation. 
And what I find is if you can't tell me how you keep your family safe from cybercrime, you're probably not going to be able to tell me how you can keep the business safe from it either. So with that, I'll, I'll kick it back to this awesome group of panelists. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to more learn more about what we do. Uh, or again, that offer for help stands uh, and it doesn't come with any strings attached. Great. Ryan, thank you so much. Great job. Uh, and Ryan may have to drop here and if we'll have his contact information at the end of this for everybody. Uh, so thanks again, Ryan. All right, James, um, you're up here. Uh, best practice is uh, partnering with managed service providers, MSPs. Go ahead, James. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, and just, just as Dan said, uh, really appreciate this opportunity to help launch uh, the VCSO community and uh, bring us together um, in ways that we can learn and grow, grow as a team. Um, so managed service providers, uh, oftentimes, you know, we, we kind of look at them as, uh, you know, the, the small, the small fry, or, or we might look at them as, uh, you know, someone that they, they kind of stick to their own, their own work. Um, uh, one thing about managed service providers, and you know, we, we probably all realize this, is that their attack surface is massive, um, based entirely on how many clients they are servicing. And every time there is some sort of a supply chain attack that affects managed service providers, it just becomes that question of holy smokes, what um, what is what's going to be the impact? And the truth is, is that that impact. Um, you could actually feel that in your own your own community. Uh, your local MSP probably supports, you know, your kid's dentist. Your local MSP might support uh, the law firm that you're actually doing your work with. Uh, if, if something happens to them, you know, like suddenly your own business can be impacted or your own family can be impacted. Um, I came from MSP background. I was with one for five and a half years before I jumped into my own company. Uh, we had 350 clients, uh, upwards of 11,000 endpoints. So if you think of that amount of access that one company, one technician who does something wrong could have, it's, it's huge. So some things that I have learned uh, both as you know, working in an MSP on the security front and also helping MSPs right now is that they, they don't always eat their own dog food. They're... Uh, they're selling uh, a really good tool to some of their clients, like uh, they're selling Sentinel One, for example, but they themselves aren't actually using it, uh, partly because they don't make any money off of those licenses. Um, not every, not every uh, vendor gives free licensings to, to their reseller uh, out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, so if you're a really small MSP and it costs you some money to to put Sentinel One on your own devices, you might just say, nope, I'm gonna skip it. Um, so that's one area. And then also your MSPs, um, they may not have always started with MSPs or as MSPs. The, the owner of my old one came from a uh, copy or print. Uh, he, he, bought it, he bought an IT company. Um, so coming from copy print uh, realm, not really thinking security. Uh, coming another one that I've worked with, uh, they were a telco, uh, VoIP provider first, and then just started selling MSP. Um, so they don't understand the security gaps. If you walk to them and said, have you had a, a gap analysis for your own stuff? Have you had a gap analysis for your bigger clients? Um, so those are areas where you can, um, uh, jump in. Uh, also, another uh, another thing that I do is uh, help explain security on a level that the small businesses uh, need to understand. Um, you know, I, I see a, a comment from Scott, and it's perfect. You know, too many MSPs sell security but don't practice it, um, and yeah, fulfilling the security they sell. Those are those are two very big things because you can sell all the security in the world. Uh, you can sell this huge stack of tools. If you haven't tuned them, uh, they're, they're worthless. If you aren't reacting to those alerts they produce, they're worthless. So us as VCSOs can step in there and help them understand, okay, it's, it's one thing to sell them a really cool tool. 
It's another thing to invest some time into making sure that the darn thing works. And that needs to start with your own environment. So they, uh, you know, that going back to that dog fooding their own thing, um, as CMMC and some of the other uh, requirements are starting to close in on MSPs, it's really, uh, it's going to be more important here soon. Um, and I don't even know how many minutes I've talked, but I am going to probably wrap this here uh, with just one thing. Every one of you on this call, every one of you that's watching this later, uh, find an MSP that is uh, in your area. Uh, to take that owner or IT director or whatever cool title they have, take them out for a lunch and just ask them what are their struggles with security and how can you help them? Uh, because it, it keeps them out of the papers and it keeps your, your own community of uh, small businesses out of the papers as well. So again, thank you for everybody's time. Thanks. Thanks, James. That was great stuff. Um, there's, there's another piece in there too, which I think is another topic for another day, but um, I, I personally work with a lot of managed service providers and they typically don't have a resource um, at your level, you know, at all of your collective levels. Um, but the consulting gap is, is there between them and the clients. And oftentimes it turns into free consulting for their best person um, because they haven't structured the type of engagement model that you guys have. And so some managed service providers now are launching uh, VCSO practices um, for the very concept, the very reason that you all are in business, um, but managing that um, and, and delivering on that is, is, a, is a pretty big animal. And so there are, there are opportunities um, to partner with MSPs in, in those ways too. Um, and I think we can hit that, at an, like I said, at another day but I did want to put that out there as well. Cool. Okay. Great stuff. Um, let's move Laura Dana, if you don't mind, I'll give you the floor here. And um, uh, if you don't mind also, I'll give a little personal uh, vouch for Laura Dana, whose uh, company NNC has supported us at Symbol uh, since our inception three and a half years ago. And, and they do a fantastic job. Their team is uh is incredibly valuable to us uh, and a true, um, I don't even consider them an extension of our, our team. They are a part, you know, they are truly um, our team. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Laura Dana. Hi everyone, really nice to meet you all. It's amazing to see that after a year, we are, you know, becoming a community. So really happy to be involved. Um, I won't keep you too long as um, I am trying to facilitate and be an enabler of this community more than anything else. And at NNC, what we do, we actually um, help and support um, the digital growth of partners with uh, and, and customers with B2B businesses. A significant portion of our customers are actually cybersecurity practices. And um, in this space, I know there's a lot of clutter and noise. So the, the industry is a bit cluttered right now. And there's a, challenge, uh, there's a challenge for companies, especially for earlier stage companies or for smaller companies to stand out in such a noisy industry. Um, but the good news is that any challenge also presents itself with some opportunities because there's so much noise, thought leadership actually is still one of the most important marks in the cybersecurity industry. And in order to be a thought leader, you don't need to brand a company, you don't need to invest a lot in marketing, you just need to show up as a professional. So what we're trying to do through the BCSO community actually is to give you a space to become this thought leader, give you the tools to be able to express yourself, author professional uh, content. We push this messaging out through social media and so on. You will hear a bit more about this later. Um, but a typical VCSO practice owner is actually trying to figure out things like how can I grow my business with um, 
limited budget and also without taking too many risks and challenges I and mean, in here i think that there's like two tiers that you could start off with and the first tier is you know make sure that you have like a professional web page landing page a, a simple but also professional and effective uh, website where if you want, you can start authoring some news blogs and so on. But if you don't have the time, we would be more than happy to help you and enable this through the VCSO community. Now, um, another thing that you can do, you can manage your LinkedIn profile in a very professional way. At NNC Services, we actually specialize in helping professionals like you um, position as you know experts in their fields, um, position themselves by having a really professional LinkedIn profile, um, making sure that uh, when you post the news or information or you get the you, you draw the right attention. And um, we, we also can help you engage with clients digitally. So I would say this is like the first year and the second year, but this is, let's say, at the later stage when you're a bit more advanced and so on, you can, um, you know, start investing in things like paid campaigns uh, for awareness. You can, you know, um, do digital events and webinars. You can educate your partners and your customers so there's a lot you can do to build credibility and educate your your prospects with uh, digital marketing i'm gonna stop here i i hope that this is useful for um the community and my role here would be as an enabler if you have questions about you know how you can get on board how you can get involved how you can benefit of, of all of this uh, i'd be happy to help thank you laura dana and laura dana's information is also going to be available her contact info um and i actually look at um you know some of the conversation that came up with um you know with, around the quickbooks concept and and outsourcing um specialists in in the financial realm uh, this was similar to us with with marketing and, and building a LinkedIn profile, building a professional website. Um, you know, those things really help from a credibility standpoint. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pivot to Symbol, which is um, is the company that that um, I run um, on a day to day basis. And I'll give you a quick two minutes on Symbol. Some of you are familiar with us, which is how I know you. Um, and, uh, and some of you may not be. Um, Symbol Security is a uh, cyber risk reduction platform, um, probably more traditionally known in the security awareness training space. Uh, we're pivoting some messaging and some of our value proposition around people cyber risk reduction. Um, and essentially, we provide a platform that manages security service providers, MSPs, virtual CISOs, security consultants can leverage to run uh, a scalable security awareness training program. And when I say scalable, um, think of if you've ever run security awareness training within an organization before, um, eliminating as much of the administration as possible while still providing an effective awareness training delivery. And then from a scalability perspective, um, being able to do things across multiple customers simultaneously uh, without uh, incorporating any more labor or admin in doing that. So how do I run security awareness training across 10, 20, 50, 100 customers without 100 times the work? Um, and that's really uh, what our platform does. And the reason we went to market really as a, um, as a third party enabler rather than a direct to customer was we felt the value added layer of awareness training was going to come from third parties. It was gonna come from the virtual CISOs that are already doing outsourced security and wrapping a number of different uh, objectives and other services into their deliverables versus us trying to be, you know, another vendor for a customer um, that already has 20 security vendors and, you know, 100 IT vendors. Um, we didn't think that was going to be a place where we would have the most impact. And it's turned out to be pretty true for us. We're scaling very nicely through third party partners. And um, 
we do offer brandable uh, distribution of our services as well. So um, giving you the ability to really take our platform and call it your own and really customize the delivery of awareness programs from a brand and perspective, content, curriculum, add your own content, um, however you want to run it. There's a lot of flexibility there so that you can really put your stamp, uh, your personal stamp or your business stamp on delivering security awareness training. So that's what we do and how we do it. Um, happy to talk to any of you um, later on uh, after this webinar if you have any questions. Uh, and certainly I share the passion that Ryan, Laura Dana also have around uh, virtual CISOs. It's um, fascinated with the community members and the value you guys provide. Um, so with that, let's move on to uh, Mike Morano. Uh, Mike, give a little uh, background on yourself and great topic here on collaborating with CFOs. Sure. Um, Craig, again, like what everybody said a little bit earlier, thanks for putting this together. Uh, everybody's been doing a fantastic job so far, and we've been really doing an excellent job of managing time, so I hope to continue to do that. So a little quick background on myself. I've been working in technology since back in the 90s, rose up through the ranks, ultimately landing in a CISO role when regulators started to demand that type of thing uh, from financial firms. And a few years ago, I, I really needed more freedom, uh, more time to do my own thing. I'll probably believe something that a lot of people on this call wanted themselves. And I started doing virtual CISO projects. And ever since then, that's what I've been focused on. Uh, virtual CISO to me has been fractional, sometimes interim, uh, project-based, hourly-based. I mean, all of the things we've been touching on. And going back to what Dan said a little bit earlier uh, about you know, one of the challenges, uh, accounting, one of the areas that we have some allies or team up with is the CFO. And that's what I wanted to bring to everybody's attention today, especially now because we're heading into Q4 and Q4 is the time when you start building out next year's budgets. So if you want your clients and your prospects, and I say prospects too, because you want to offer that free advice to help them budget for you for next year, uh, work with the CFOs. In many cases, the CFOs know more about what we do than anybody because CFOs just mentioned Enron. Uh, Enron, if you don't remember, they're coming up on the 20 year anniversary where it was a financial disaster. The company cooked the books. They didn't have any, what we call today, shadow accounting. And I like to teach the CFOs that a virtual CISO or cybersecurity uh, consultant can be like your shadow accountant. We're there to look over your program, to make sure you're, maybe you have an MSP, make sure they're doing the right thing, make sure that you're on track in compliance with your own policies. CFOs understand that. So when you talk to the CFOs, that's one of the things that you want to really push. We're like having somebody like your shadow accounting team. And they also understand outsourcing because in many cases, they're outsourcing bookkeeping, uh, general ledger, some of the other things to your QuickBooks and FreshBooks and some of the other services that folks have been describing all throughout this, this conversation. Another thing that they understand too is data. CFOs look at the bottom line. They understand return on investment. And that's something that they could also teach us when speaking with other executives in the organization. Help us take what we do and make it a business uh, instead of a cost center, you know, show it as a PR piece, show it as having a competitive advantage. And those are some of the things I've learned working with CFOs over the last couple of years. And of course, in many small organizations, the CFO sometimes is in charge of compliance. They sometimes have the multi-hat, uh, chief compliance officer, chief operating officer, and many of those uh, titles also oversee technology and cybersecurity as part of their world. But that's what I wanted to, to bring to everybody's attention today, especially as we, we roll into Q4, end of year, start thinking about helping those CFOs out with their budgets. As you start networking, CFOs are a great person to get to know. Those are the folks you want to take the lunch as well as those MSPs, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'll end up back to Good. That's great stuff, Mike. Uh, definitely want to take them to lunch and um, also help them uh, – helping them really understand um, the costs of delivering the proper security solutions too. I mean, I think there's a lot there. Um, it's a great topic. Okay, uh, cool. Let's move on to Michael Markulik uh, and another incredible topic here, which I think is, it's just really fascinating for um, 
a lot of small businesses too, even outside of, you know, the the VC cell practice is is scaling out. And I've I've known Michael now for um, quite a while, and I'm I'm watching him and his business scale, and it's it's been pretty cool to see. So, Michael, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you here. Michael, you on mute? I am on mute. Um, yeah, just a quick background. Uh, started my career in the Army. Uh, got into networking uh, early in the cybersecurity uh, uh, game. Um, eventually uh, became CEO of a cybersecurity software firm that was selling primarily to um, uh, the federal government and large financial services. Um, and what I'd like to talk about is kind of taking off that technology hat and, and, and kind of putting on your CEO hat um, and, and really thinking about how to grow your practice. Um, it, you know, one of the challenges that most entrepreneurs face is that, you know, the initial success of being a one-man band or a small, you know, two, three, four-person shop um, is, is relatively straightforward, relatively easy. As you continue to um, you know, increase your presence, increase your footprint, uh, build out your own uh, ecosystem, you know, things become a lot more difficult. Um, so I, I wanted to touch on a couple areas um, where we've had success and where, where we still see some challenges in the uh, cybersecurity world. First of which is staffing. Um, you know, I, I don't think we can pick up a technology uh, magazine or, or, you know, get on, a, get on a security blog where we don't see about the shortage of, of cybersecurity expertise, staff. Um, and, and we have... You know, we have seen it at Harbor over the past couple of years in terms of our hiring of um, additional technology resources. One of the things that I think we've done uh, uniquely is gone out and uh, retain interns, college students over the summer, and really bring them in, give them some hands-on skills, and then when they graduate, um, you know, move them into full-time positions. Don't expect that they're going to stay with us forever, but we do get, you know, uh, you know, educated, trained, uh, hardworking young men and women to kind of come in and help fill out the ranks of our, uh, of our technology team. The other thing that I think a lot of us struggle with is how to fund growth, right? How to, you know, how to um, make investments, whether those investments be in additional staff, uh, additional technology, additional certifications, um, and, and there are a lot of opportunities out there that entrepreneurs just don't seem to take advantage of. Um, you know, the SBA, the Small Business Administration, has a tremendous um, SBA loan program um, that allows you to get working capital to make investments in your business. Um, it comes at a relatively low interest point. Um, so it's very, a very attractive way to kind of think about growing your business. And, and kind of the third thing I'd, I'd like you to think about as you, you know, think about growing your business is you've got that, you know, more of that CEO hat on than the, than the, the CISO hat it is, you know, building out your own ecosystem. Um, we've talked a little bit about MSPs. We've talked a little bit about technology providers, but I think that ecosystem has got to be, you know, greater than that. Um, you know, it is the local, um, you know, CPAs. Um, it is the local chamber of commerce. It is, you know, local peer-to-peer -peer organizations like Vistage, where you can get in front of and talk to, you know, dozens of CEOs over the course of a year. And by building out that ecosystem, by building out a, a set of referral partners is probably the best way to describe them. Um, I, I think you can scale your business tremendously. The other thing that that provides is within the community, um, you know, uh, the ability to leverage expertise. Um, we're, we're not experts in forensics. We'll tell you that right up front. Um, but we do have partners in the VSISO community who are experts in forensics, who we can lean on when we have a forensics related project. Um, and I think by building out your ecosystem, by thinking about who your referral partners are, and by actively engaging them, uh, this is not a one-way street where they, you know, they they throw leads over the fence to you. This is really about having conversations about how they're growing their business, how you're growing your business, 
and how you can help each other do so. Um, and if anybody wants any ideas or suggestions in that uh, arena, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to do so. I get in front of uh, CEO organizations. I get in front of uh, CFO, CPA organizations. I speak at their conferences for uh, CPE credits. Um, all of those kind of things, building out that ecosystem of, of partners has been what it has really allowed us to grow you know, we're, you know, 50 plus percent year over year for the past couple of years. Um, and we continue to kind of pour gas on that fire um, by leveraging things like the SBA loans and our ability to fund growth. So if anybody's got any questions on that, I'm, you know, I think it's an important topic. I think a lot of us start as, you know, one man bands um, and struggle with the idea of becoming an orchestra. Um, you know, I'm looking at how, you know, we become an orchestra and then, and then repeat that model and continue to grow. So, um, if anybody's got any thoughts, any comments, I'm, I'm happy to have those conversations. Excellent. Great stuff, Michael. Um, and I, another topic that we could go on for quite a bit on, um, okay. So we're coming up on the top of the hour. Um, I want to hit something that, uh, that we've built here, and that's the um, that's the VCSO community portal. So let me see if I can bring that in here for a moment, and then I think we'll close uh, with some with some comments and some feedback from the group, if that's okay. Um, we'll provide contact information and next steps. And I see some of you uh, looks like have come on to, to uh, sign up as a member in the in the VCSO news community, which is excellent. So let's do this. I'm gonna play a quick video here. Sound should be enabled. Um, so Laura Dana was good enough to walk us through the platform. It's about two minutes in length. Um, so we'll just we'll play that and then we'll have a couple minutes to close out. At VCSO News, we are excited about building a central point of news and information for the VCSO community. Can everyone hear? With this community, we hope you will become one of the thought leaders in your space while creating powerful relations with professional peers. The platform for top influencers in the VCSO professional community is just launching right now, and I would love to show you around a bit. Uh, what you will find in our VCSO news community are events, a members area, a contributors area, news, and so much more. One of the First things that you can do is benefit of quite a bit of exposure through both the current This Is On News website, which is gathering more and more traction and awareness every day. You can post news, articles, information that you'd like to share with your customers, partners, or information that you would like us to push out through our social media channels, like, for example, uh, LinkedIn, through Twitter, perhaps, um, and through other channels that we're using to push the news and information out. What that means is that once you register as a member in the VCSO community, you get access to uh, our members' profiles and you can advertise your own expertise. As you know, when you have a project, maybe either you or someone else needs a certain type of expertise that they don't necessarily have. Another way in which you can benefit is, of course, the forum area. And in the forum area, uh, for example, you can look what are some of the topics and, and members use this forum to uh, share their expertise, to engage in conversation, to ask questions that they are preoccupied. You, as you see, we also have a very interesting mobile app where you can see some of the features that are available at hand at the push up a button. Uh, and if you um, would like, you can actually engage and interact through the mobile app with any member in your um community, in, in the VCSO community. That's great. Um, thank you for putting that together, Laura Dana. So um, we've been working on this community platform uh, for a little while. And look, it's it's early. Um, so I want you all to understand that as we, uh, you know, as we introduce this group and the community, uh, we're definitely at a formative stage. Um, so there's going to be things about the platform, about the community that we're going to have to build um, that aren't there today. And so for those reasons, we welcome your participation. We welcome your feedback. Um, and I would say, you know, for sensitive or other um, proprietary type information, I would 
suggest maybe you reach directly to people offline for now. Um, let's get this thing up and rolling in very much a collaborative manner, but um, you know, give us some time to ramp and grow um, the community, uh, you know, and its and its definitions and its um, you know and its structure and everything like that. Um, so that's just a you know kind of a conservative approach I have around this. We see the value in uh, connecting you all. Um, we also, I don't know if it came through in, in the video or came through in, in any other interactions you've had with VCSO News, but we, we see a huge value for each of you and your brand um, in being able to put yourself out as a thought leader through the VCSO News platform. So pick a topic that you want to author, um, write a nice article on it, and potentially, you know, Laura, Laura Dana's team, um, you know, can help the structure of that article. And then we can publish that through the VCSO News platform, give it a boost on social media. Ideally, it's, um, you know, it's a win for you, gives you some exposure, um, and it does a good thing for the public at the same time, because I think as we continue to hear from you all, you have great experiences, a ton of value to offer. Um, just how do we get your message out to the broader public? And so we see VCSO, VCSO News as a, as a way to do that. Um, from a structural perspective, um, Laura, Dana, and I are uh, the sort of the creators of VCSO News. Um, we do not want to be the, uh, the dictators of what VCSO News and the community becomes. We want that to come from you all. And um, so we're not at the point yet where we've, figured out exactly how we're going to empower um, some of you to help us with management of that, deciding on topics that are important. Um, but we're hoping that over the near term, we can figure that part out. And so we might be asking some of you to uh, roll up your sleeves and, and step into um, at least uh, functional leadership positions to help us uh, do our part in facilitating and allow you all to be really be the, the leaders of this because that's the intention. Um, so with that, we've reached uh, the end of the hour and I don't wanna shut this down yet because I'm sure there's some questions, I'm sure there's uh, some thoughts. So for those of you that do have to break because it's now 12 noon Eastern, 11 Central, um, feel free to, we can connect uh, certainly over email um, and, and we can connect as a, as a community as well. Um, but I'm gonna suggest that we leave this open for another five minutes or so. Um, and as we do that, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna put the sponsor contact information up on the screen as well. So I'll stop here. Uh, we can come off mute for any of you that are on mute. Are there any questions or anything that anyone wanted to add, suggestions, uh, et cetera? I see there's some discussion already going on in the chat pane. Um, if you want to get off mute and just, uh, you know, share or ask your questions, go ahead. Great. Um, Bill, I see your question in there as well. Um, definitely uh, on my mind, privacy, uh, privacy concerns. Um, I think that's a big one um, for us to tackle, as well as setting the right expectations of what maybe you should and shouldn't do and share on the community. Um, I'm, yeah, very much in tune to that, um, as well as, you know, for you all just determining what you want to do to help a network and then what's really your IP. Um, and, and so that's really, I think, something that you need to consider. But, you know, Putting that aside, there's definitely a, a value to um, to leveraging each other and and collaborating with each other. I think we saw that already today. Yeah, I, I asked the question for a couple of reasons. One, completely self-serving, you know, shameless plug. Um, about sixty percent of my company's practice, not mine, is currently privacy. We started like eighteen months ago with zero percent privacy, and it's growing yeah. immensely. Um, my, my partner manages the privacy side of the business, and honestly, I can't hire enough people to handle the privacy stuff that's coming in. But the reason why I ask is for myself, with my clients, with other 
people working as CISOs, virtual CISOs that I talk to, everyone's getting hammered with questions about how do we deal with privacy. You know, um, traditional IT governance models don't cover privacy controls. Nobody wants to own it. Nobody knows what to do with it. And I'm just wondering, you know, I would love to have, again, not for self-serving purposes, I'd love to understand how you guys are batting those or whacking those moles because, um, you know, I know what we do, but I'd really like to hear what other people are doing and how you're thinking about it because um, it's, it's a huge issue. I mean, from a regulatory perspective, it's, it's, it's a bigger, my practice has been predicated upon HIPAA for many years. This is a bigger issue than HIPAA by far. Yeah, I, I can tell you from from my perspective, you know, I've run privacy uh, organizations when I was uh, the actual CISO himself and privacy would roll underneath me. Um, so I'm very versed in having the conversation, but again, I hand it off to that specialist then. And when I say hand off, I bring in. So it might be something that as I'm engaging with a, a more specific privacy conversation with a client or a prospect, I'm bringing in a partnered privacy firm. More than likely, I'm bringing in my, my my partnered privacy law firm that specializes in cybersecurity and privacy law um, for them to talk about the privacy aspect of things um, in conjunction with me is how I handle it. And, and I think that that's great. My reaction to that would be that attorneys understand privacy policy. What they don't have a clue about is how do you operationalize privacy? How do you actually comply with GDPR, CCPA, Ohio, Virginia, Washington, whatever. They don't have- Oh yeah, absolutely. They don't, they don't, yeah. yeah, so, I, so I've got the law. What I find is a lot of times is my clients, they don't, they first need to understand what the privacy law is because they read about it in Wall Street Journal and that's the extent of what they know. It's like, hey, I should be concerned about this, right? Yes, you should. What does that mean? So that's where the attorneys do that education. Then I've got partners from the operational side of things that come in and actually build those privacy programs along, you know, in conjunction with what I've, my experiences. Great. Um, any else, any other questions, any other asks of BCSO news in the community, like what you'd like to see from it um, as we, as we close out here. So happy to take any requests, any visions, any, best practices from other communities and platforms you've been a part of as well. Okay. I, I may have a suggestion, Craig. Uh, I see that there's quite a few topics that require a longer conversation. Maybe uh, we should think about turning this into like a regular once a month event where we bring one of these topics to the table and uh, we meet on that specific topic and we maybe bring someone that's an expert on the topic yeah. and so on. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think um, the other thing that's on my mind for the 17 that are left here um, is I think there's value in, in transparency between you all. And part of that I think is, um, might be dependent on, you know, how small or vetted um, the community is. And so I'm going to talk to a few of the virtual CISOs that, um, that we've been working with for probably the longest um, to ask them how they feel about, you know, membership, what that means, um, how that gets qualified. Uh, but if any of you that maybe are newer to, to me, I haven't, I haven't met you, I haven't spent a lot of time with you. If you have feelings on that, I'd love to hear that too. I think this is an important part for you all to consider um, how public does the community piece get, um, you know, is there a taper between the broader, more public community in terms of content and, you know, and contribution there? And then, you know, another smaller community that it shares at a, you know, at a more vetted level. So something to think about. Um, I don't have an opinion yet, it's, it's, uh, but it is, it is something I've thought about and I just kind of came to the conclusion that I don't think, I have the answer, <laughs> so um, I'm hoping that you all, through your, you know, through your um, opinions and 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 you know, consensus, will will help us get to that answer. All right. Well, listen, I think um, we probably tapped out in terms of time and content um, for today. 
thank you so much for everybody that contributed and, and everybody that uh, that hung out here um, for the duration. We'll be in touch. Um, you know where to find us as well, and we'll we'll we have your information, so we'll get you the VC So News contact information. We'll sum up this event, and um, you will definitely be hearing from us in terms of um, in terms of next steps and um, and additional uh, communications between us. But this was great. Excellent start. Thank you all for your time. Uh, and everybody have a great Thursday. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.